Welcome to Evidence Based, a new Harbinger psychology podcast. I'm your host, Cassie Stossel. On today's episode, we're talking about ACT and relationships. We're joined by Russ Harris, author of ACT with Love. Russ is an internationally acclaimed acceptance and commitment therapy trainer and author of the best selling ACT based self help book, The Happiness Trap, which has sold more than 1 million copies and been published in 30 languages. He is widely renowned for his ability to teach ACT in a way that is simple, clear, and fun, yet extremely practical. Hi, Russ. Thanks so much for joining us on Evidence Based. No, oh, thanks so much for inviting me. So I thought we could start off by talking about why can ACT be really helpful for couples? Well, <laughs> love and pain uh, dance partners, they go hand in hand. So when you've got two people spending a lot of time together, there's going to be conflict and tension and difficulty. You know, not all the time, but it's inevitable. When I run workshops, uh, I ask the audience, put your hand up if if you spend a lot of time with another person and in that relationship, there are no difficult thoughts and feelings whatsoever. You know, <laughs> And of course, not a hand goes up. Even dogs, right? Dogs are a lot easier to live with than humans. And even dogs will push your buttons. So if you've got two humans living together or spending a lot of time together, there's going to be all sorts of problems, difficulties, conflicts, tensions, uh, lots of painful thoughts and feelings. And so ACT is brilliant at kind of helping to take the power and impact out of those thoughts and feelings so that they don't jerk you around and pull you into destructive relationship draining behaviors. ACT is also very good at helping you tap into your values about the sort of person you want to be, exploring who do I want to be in this relationship and what sort of partner do I want to be and how do I want to treat the other person. And uh, of course, you know, fundamental to a healthy relationship is just really being present with and open to and accepting of the other person. So that the better you can do that, the better <laughs> the quality of your relationship. Absolutely. And you mentioned in your workshops, you know, you asked the question of if anyone has no difficulties and no hands go up. In your book, you talk about the three myths of love. And I feel like that ties in really well. Can you talk about those? <laughs> There's lots of myths uh, about love, but <laughs> Three that uh, that come up over and over again. One is this idea of the perfect partner. Did you know, Cassie, you've got a soulmate out there that is your perfect partner, ideal for you in every way. And when you find this perfect match, oh gosh, then you'll know what true love is, right? And and of course, you know, this myth is perpetuated by books and movies and and so forth. And, you know, then linked to that myth is the idea that love should be easy. And so if you if there is conflict or tension or boredom or frustration or, you know, anything difficult going on in the relationship, well, that means there's something wrong. Love should be easy. This idea that you actually have to work hard at it. And uh, if you're just falling in and out of love with people sequentially for a few months and then moving on, well, that's a different story. But if you're kind of, you know, hanging in there and wanting to make a relationship last in the long term, it requires lots of hard effort. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, that goes against the myth. Um, and then kind of linked to both of those myths is this idea of everlasting love. When you've got that perfect partner, it's not just that love should be easy, it should be everlasting. You should always be feeling this wonderful, you know, uh, moments, head over heels. And again, if, if you're not, there's something wrong. So collectively, those myths just set people up for a struggle with reality. Absolutely. And they don't, you know, feed into any sort of longevity of a relationship. That's all just sort of this at the beginning phase, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and so we do see this in the media. We see kind of rock stars and movie stars who <laughs> just go through one relationship after another with these, you know, it all seems like this blissful love and all your dreams fulfilled. And then six months later, they're in divorce courts, you know, it's, um, yeah, we won't name any names. <laughs> uh, in your book, you use the acronym DRAIN to remember the ways in which we respond inflexibly in a relationship. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, so DRAIN is an acronym that the D is for disconnection, the R is for reactivity, the A is for avoidance, 
The I is for inside your mind and the N is for neglecting values. So D for disconnection, you know, when you cut off, when you disconnect, when you're not present, uh, when you're not paying attention, that's a recipe for disaster. Reactivity, we all know what this is like. We get jerked around by our thoughts and feelings like we're a puppet on a string. And the more reactive we are, the more on automatic pilot we are, uh, the more likely we are to act in ways that are unhealthy uh, or damaging to the relationship. The A is for avoidance. You know, lots of the work around making a relationship really successful and fulfilling and rewarding is uncomfortable. Um, you know, particularly if you have to have those difficult heart to heart conversations, for example. Uh, and so if you're in avoidance mode, trying to avoid all discomfort, you'll often avoid doing the very necessary work to build a relationship. The I inside your mind is a uh, user friendly term for cognitive fusion. You get all caught up in your thoughts. And of course, uh, this can manifest as ruminating, worrying, analysis, paralysis, you know, fantasizing about how your life would be better with someone else uh, and so on and so on. And the more you get caught up inside your mind, the less able you are to be present with and connected to your partner. So these all kind of overlap and interweave and ultimately lead to the end, neglecting your values. When you get down to it, most people have pretty similar values in their relationships about the sort of person they want to be. They want to be about loving and kindness and caring and support and openness and honesty. And these values often get lost when we get hooked and jerked around by our thoughts and feelings. Then we start, you know, we may start holding on to rigid rules of right or wrong or holding on to blame or becoming very judgmental and the values just go out the window. One thing I noted when I was reading the drain portion is I appreciated that you had the reminder that both partners can be draining the relationship because I feel like it's really easy to play that blame game when you're activated and you think you've done nothing wrong. So I really appreciated that reminder in there. Oh, yes. Well, of course, I've never played the blame game <laughs> in a relationship. <laughs> exactly. Everyone else does, but not. It's, it's common in, in couples counseling. You know, both partners come with the same agenda. I'm OK. Fix my partner. It comes naturally to us to kind of blame and point the finger, but we do need to look at ourselves. That doesn't mean that both partners are always equally uh, contributing to the problems in the relationship, but they are contributing in some way. Um, so uh, it's very important to have a look at, you know, what you're doing. Sure. And those those drain, all the activities in the drain acronym are what inflexibility looks like. On the opposite end, what does it look like to be psychologically flexible in your relationship? Well, I like to summarize psychological flexibility as being present, opening up and doing what matters. So first of all, we're present in our relationship. I'm actually paying attention to you uh, with openness and curiosity. I'm interested in knowing about your world and what you're doing. You know, and when you meet someone for the first time, you know, that comes naturally. But as you know someone for a long time, it's easy to start to lose interest. Your, your mind sort of paints a portrait of the other person and you start relating to that portrait rather than the real ever-changing human being paying attention with openness curiosity being fully there with your partner and laughing because uh, I'm sometimes not very good at this uh, you know and my partner says to me where are you and I'm like, oh sorry uh, 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 but it's so easy to drift off so that coming back again and again and again our mind will pull us in a million and one directions but bring it back to the person you're with right now uh, and then opening up, uh, you know, that's a user friendly way of talking about diffusion and acceptance, opening up, making room for all the difficult thoughts and feelings that are guaranteed to show up um, in, uh, in, a, in any loving, caring relationship at times, uh, letting that stuff flow through you so that you can be present and do what matters, kind of act on your values, be the person you want to be, be the sort of partner you want to be, or the parent you want to be, or the friend you want to be. There are many forms of, of loving relationships. Absolutely. And we talked a little bit about that being aware of your own actions in a relationship. And so much of this work requires you to be self-aware and both partners to have that self-awareness. Do you have any ways that people can start to cultivate more self-awareness? Yeah, well, I think really... 
any mindfulness practice will develop self-awareness. Um, but I, I think there's more. I mean, one is, you know, certainly if we're talking about intimate partnerships, is to have regular talks with your partner. Say, can, can we, you know, give each other some feedback on, on how the relationship's going and what's working and what's not going uh, so well? And, you know, this is often nice to put aside time. And I, I, I say to people, you know, it's up to you. It might be once a week. It might be once a month. Maybe you go for a drink or a coffee or a walk in the park and you actually just kind of discuss and give each other positive feedback about what you're liking and also some kind, compassionate negative feedback about what's not working that's uh, because feedback from others is such an important part of self-awareness uh, and and then of course you know uh, recognizing your own <laughs> if you've been in a relationship with someone for a while or, or previous relationships you, you you should have a fairly good idea of what you do that's uh, annoying or difficult or contributes to the problems and uh, and having a look at you know what can I do to modify that it, it's a real dance routine between both people because obviously as we've said there is no perfect partner I, I, I say to individual clients you know do, do you always do the things that you think you ought to do no right okay so what chance has your partner got of doing all the things that you think they ought to do it's just not going to happen um uh, you know have you eliminated all your annoying habits that annoy you personally so what chance has your partner got of eliminating this so, so there is uh, some acceptance required but also it's about having a look can i lift my game are there areas uh you know where where you know a little bit of effort on my part would make a big difference to my partner so all those things really yeah, that's funny. I was thinking about all the annoying things I do, and I'm sure I've only gotten worse since me and my husband work from home together for the last three years. So there's no separate time. <laughs> yes, that home working situation, boy, does that uh, <laughs> raise the stakes, doesn't it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> One thing in your book you wrote about is that your first strategy in practice with couples is to ask them about their relationship before their problems. Why, why is this your first approach? Well, it gathers a lot of information very quickly. I ask people, you know, where did you meet? What was it about your partner that you found attractive aside from their looks? I always put that bit in about aside from their looks because, <laughs> you know, looks may have changed if they've been together for 20 or 30 years, you know, oh, you know, he used to have a six pack and look at him now. He's a fat slob, you know. Uh, <laughs> You don't want to open the door to that kind of thing. Uh, but but what attracted you aside from looks uh, is, a, is a useful question. At what point did you realize you were in love with each other? What did you think were his or her or their greatest qualities when you first met them? And, and so asking these questions with a lot of couples uh, taps into some very positive memories. You know, they've been so focused on all the problems for so long and they're in such a state of resentment. And before coming into therapy, they've rehearsed what they're going to say about the problems or defending themselves against attack and so forth. And, and so, it, you know, often takes them by surprise um, and often helps them tap into positive memories. If one or both partners are unable to say anything positive if you get this kind of like I can't remember I have no idea you know even we had problems right from the start even our wedding day was a disaster you know then you know there's big big problems there but uh, with most people there'll be a fairly positive response to that and uh, you know you'll see faces soften and smiles play up and you can comment on that um, uh, so it, it starts to set a different tone for the relationship for the session it gets people's defenses down yeah that's important I feel like to soften before delving into those issues one other part of your work is something called the choice point can you talk more about what that is the choice point is a very powerful tool that was co-created by uh, myself and Joe Cherokee and Anne Bailey. I think it's my favorite tool in ACT. It's a very simple visual map that really maps out the whole ACT model, um, just with two diverging arrows. Uh, one shoots up the page to the left top corner and one shoots up the page to the right top corner and they meet in the middle near the bottom. 
Um, and you know, the left arrow is is titled the away arrow, and the right arrow is titled the towards arrow. And basically, everything you do all day long either takes you away from the sort of life you want to live and the person you want to be, um, or it takes you towards the the life you want to build and the person you want to be. Um, and what you write at the bottom of the choice point is all the difficult thoughts and feelings and situations that are showing up in your life today. And then on the away arrow, you write down the away moves, the way that you respond to those thoughts, feelings and situations that's counterproductive or problematic or self-defeating that takes you uh, away from what you want uh, and ways that you respond that are flexible and effective and values based and mindful. Although at the start of therapy, obviously, you don't have that terminology, but just kind of things you do when this difficult stuff shows up that actually work well for you and help you you know, be more of the person you want to be and build the life you want to build. And that's kind of your towards moves. Uh, you know, technically, that's your values, congruent, effective behavior. And your away moves are values, incongruent, ineffective behavior. So it's a, it's a very simple way of mapping out the app model and what we're aiming to do. And, yeah, you know, with, with a, a relationship issue, you can plot that on the choice point. What takes you away from the relationship you want and what takes you towards it? And what are the difficult thoughts and feelings that are showing up and hooking you and pulling you into those away moves? And then we can bring in some unhooking skills. Uh, unhooking is a, a term I use for, you know, any combination of diffusion, acceptance, present moment. Um, I think it's a much better term to use than mindfulness because um, there's so many misunderstandings about mindfulness these days. Um, many people think mindfulness is a, a meditation practice or they think it's a religious practice or uh, or it's Buddhism or something. So uh, I, I, I use the term unhooking skills rather than mindfulness skills. Um, and, and, and we can learn how to unhook from these difficult thoughts and feelings and come back to our values and choose more towards moves, which will help us build a better relationship. I like that unhooking. It feels like it simplifies it because it's very visual. And we talked about values. I was actually going to ask about the toward and away from if that was values based. Can you talk about why it's important to connect with those values? Well, values are pivotal to the ACT model because, um, well, first of all, they provide guidance. They're, they're often described as a compass. They give you direction, help you find your way. So, so, so they're like an inner guide for your actions and your behavior. They also provide motivation. You know, they're like a, a source of energy. If I've got to do the the hard work of actually making this relationship uh, meaningful, fulfilling, satisfying, what what's my motivation? And uh, values are often a source of energy that actually motivates. This is about being loving. This is about caring. This is about being the sort of person I want to be, you know, or this is about giving and contributing and helping. Um, and uh, I suppose the third factor is they provide inspiration. Very often, uh, if we're a bit stuck, we come back to our values and ask, what do I do here? And where do I go from here? And what might be helpful here? And just being able to tune into those core values around loving and caring and connecting often uh, gives us some ideas. And how are those values different from other things like goals or needs or rules in your relationship? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they're, they're, it's important. I'm glad you asked because, you know, the, the, those are very important differences, particularly between rules. We easily uh, get hooked by rigid rules in our relationships, which can uh, be identified often by words like should, have to, must, ought, Albert. Ellis, the famous psychologist, referred to this as masturbation. Uh, you know, you must do it this way and you shouldn't do it that way. Um, these rules can go both ways. So you can kind of get some people uh, have what I call people pleasing rules where they fuse with or, uh, rules like, you know, I have to always please others. My needs come second. Everyone else comes first. And, you know, that can uh, lead to being pretty miserable in a relationship. Your needs get always suppressed and squashed as you look after everyone else. Um, but, it, you know, other forms of rules uh, will create a lot of conflict and tension in relationships. 
you should do this way and you shouldn't do it that way and you have to do it like this and if you don't do it like that and often those rules themselves are linked up with judgments if if i don't follow my rule then i'm a bad person if you don't follow my rule then you're a bad person uh, so rules are rigid they're constricting they're like commands that you have to obey they give you limited choice and they're often identified by by words like should have to must or right wrong this way not that way always never you know and so you can feel when you're following a rule it's restrictive uh, whereas a value can usually be said in one word, you know, loving or caring or kindness. There's an infinite number of ways of living that value. Whereas a rule, you know, uh, um, I have to always please others, locks you down. Then there's, um, uh, what did you say, goals? So goals are, uh, you know, a very important part of the app model. Goals are what I want to have or get or achieve. Uh, whereas values are how I want to behave, you know, how I want to treat myself, how I want to treat others, how I want to treat the world around me. So we want to use our values to inspire the goals that we set for ourselves. At the same time, we need to be realistic. You know, we're not going to achieve all our goals. We'll achieve some of them. <laughs> no way we'll achieve all of them. But the lovely thing is we can live our values even if we don't achieve our goals. We can live our values every step of the way towards achieving a goal. Um, and we can live them even if the goal falls flat or something gets in the way of it. So they're quite liberating that way. Needs. Well, <laughs> needs are basically very, very, very important goals. They're, they're things that uh, I really feel like I need to have to have a, a good life. Uh, and so, of course, you know, it, it's important that we try to get our needs met and it's important that we realize we won't always get our needs met. And how do we cope with that? There are effective ways of coping with that, such as acceptance and self-compassion and living your values. And there are ineffective ways of coping with that, uh, such as aggression or hostility or, you know, all the things that we do to fruitlessly try to escape from our pain. You know, it, we, we're not going to always get our needs met. And that is painful. It also sounds like the difference of values is your val like living by your values is something that you have control over versus all of those other things have other external factors that play into them. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you think that's a good way of putting it, you know, if you think about a relationship, this, you know, you want to explore what I want to contribute to the relationship and what I want to get from the relationship. And so when we're talking about needs, we're looking about what I want to get from the relationship. Now, our values influence how we go about getting our needs met. So, you know, if we try to get our needs met through aggression or hostility or manipulation, or that's going to be destructive to the relationship. But if I tap into my values around kindness and caring and loving, and I try to get my needs met in ways that are aligned with those values, it's going to be much healthier for the relationship. Definitely. When you talk about conflict and pain arising, you write about two ways we might respond with obey mode or struggle mode. Can you talk about those? Yeah, so obey mode and struggle mode are, are user-friendly terms for fusion and experiential avoidance. So obey mode basically means your thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories show up and they completely dominate you. They dominate your awareness. They dominate your behavior. They jerk you around like a puppet on a string you obey you obey what these thoughts and feelings are telling you to do yeah, that's basically fusion struggle mode is basically experiential avoidance you struggle against these thoughts and feelings you uh, try to fight with them suppress them um, or escape avoid run away from them um, and most people uh, prior to act, those are their predominant modes of responding to difficult thoughts and feelings. They either kind of fuse with them, they dominate it, obey, uh, or they struggle, they fight and, and run from them. What we're offering is a third way of responding that's radically different to both of those two. And because it is so radically different, it's um, it's often a bit uh, daunting or, or scary for, for clients. And of course, it requires practice. 
Absolutely. And that alternative would be one of our other acronyms, the ACE formula. Can you talk about that? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I guess the, the alternative overall is kind of like opening up and, and making room and allowing these thoughts and feelings to be there, uh, or technically is is flexible responding to these difficult thoughts and feelings. One of the my favorite skills in, in teaching people how to do this early on in therapy um, or early on in self-help books is um, something that I call dropping anchor. <laughs> so dropping anchor is an umbrella term for literally hundreds of different mindfulness exercises, uh, but they all follow a basic formula, the ACE formula. So <laughs> another acronym, the A is for acknowledging your inner world or acknowledging your thoughts and feelings, basically acknowledging whatever's showing up in this moment. Uh, the C is for uh, connect with your body. Um, so in, in some way you move your body and notice what it's like. And the E is for uh, engage in the activity that you're doing or engage in the world around you. And so dropping anchor exercises involves cycling through these processes it, in any order. It doesn't have to be A-C-E, it can be C-E-A or AEC or whatever, and been usually cycling through these three or four times over the space of a couple of minutes um, helps people sort of ground and center themselves. Um, and you can make long exercises that go for up to 10 minutes or ultra brief exercises that go for 10 seconds. You know, it's, it's a very flexible way of creating a, a very simple mindfulness exercise. So with the, the A part, the acknowledging part, you basically just non-judgmentally uh, acknowledge thoughts and feelings. You know, I'm noticing thoughts about, I'm noticing feelings of, just uh, which is the first step in both diffusion and acceptance, that just non-judgmental acknowledging and allowing of, of the thoughts and feelings showing up. And then the C is really just kind of getting people in touch with their physical actions in some way. So it could be, you know, the straightening up your spine or pushing your feet into the floor or having a stretch or, you know, taking a slow, gentle breath, anything that kind of helps you physically connect with some part of your body. Um, and, uh, you know, that's obviously adapted to the, the person that you're working with. Um, you know, if, if somebody's got chronic pain syndrome and pushing their feet into the floor makes that worse, then you wouldn't push your feet into the floor. But what you might do is gently change your position in the chair to a more comfortable one and notice how you do that. So anything that really helps you connect with physical movement. Um, and then the E, uh, depending on the situation, is either engaging in the world around you through the five senses, noticing where you are and what you're doing and what's going on, or more commonly engaging in the activity you're doing, assuming that it's a, you know, a, a meaningful values guided activity, bringing your full attention to the activity and, and you know, getting absorbed and engaged in it. And so it's really quite remarkable how, uh, you know, these is, this is such an easy uh, skill to teach and uh, you can usually teach someone in a few minutes. Uh, it's so different to all those mindfulness exercises, the traditional meditative stuff where you sit still with your eyes closed and focus on your breath. You know, these exercises are much more uh, engaging for people because you're moving, because you're stretching, because you're noticing the world around you and so forth. So it, it's often my my first line method that I kind of uh, teach people or uh, introduce in my self-help books. I like that it feels more accessible. Like you mentioned earlier, you know, mindfulness has become this big thing that means a lot of things that it, it doesn't actually mean. So I like the accessibility of, you know, the ACE formula. I think it makes it easy to do. And, you know, you said you can do it in 10 seconds. That's a, a really nice promise. Well, it's, you know, it's so important. Uh, I mean, you know, another nice thing about dropping anchor exercises, the, the, the metaphor is that, you know, your, your boat's sailing into the harbour and suddenly a storm blows up. What do you need to do? You, well, you need to drop anchor because if you don't, your boat's going to get swept out to sea. And so it's the same with emotional storms, you know, where we want to drop anchor so they don't kind of sweep us away from our values or or sweep us, you know, away from our relationship and so forth. I like this metaphor because, you know, when, when an anchor doesn't control the storm. It holds the boat steady. The storm will come and go in its own good time, as does an emotional storm. If people use this metaphor, it's very important to specify that the boat's in the harbor because out at sea, boats don't drop anchor in a storm. <laughs> 
they capsized. Back in 2015, the World Health Organization asked me to write um, an act protocol for use in refugee camps around the world. And it needed to be a, a trauma sensitive uh, protocol because, you know, obviously in refugee camps, uh, there's a lot of trauma. Many of those traditional mindfulness meditations are, are not trauma sensitive. Uh, there's a danger if you sit there with your eyes closed, you know, kind of tuning into your inner world. There's a danger that you'll have flashbacks or re experience the trauma or dissociate and so forth. So in the uh, the World Health Organization protocol, we made dropping anchor the first mindfulness practice. And uh, we just kind of started with very short 10 second exercises and then built up to sort of much longer five minute, seven minute exercises. Uh, and people responded really well. You know, uh, the, the big randomized control trial they did on this, it was in a Ugandan refugee camp with South Sudanese refugees. There was like 600 participants in that trial, and there was what not one, not one single reported adverse incident. It, it, certainly for therapists in practice, if you're working with couples, you will encounter a significant uh, number that have had trauma backgrounds. And uh, so it's a nice um, trauma sensitive uh, practice that you can it's good for anybody and everybody, you know, and it's quick to learn, uh, which is another reason why I included it in, in the uh, in that protocol, uh, because, you know, many people in these refugee camps are in cultures that have never heard of anything like this. It's just completely, utterly weird, but um, it's very doable. And can be a game changer. That's really important. Earning your continuing education hours doesn't have to be a painful experience. The right course can open your mind to new possibilities, increase your confidence, and hand you powerful tools to transform your clients' lives. Praxis Continuing Education and Training teams up with some of the brightest minds in mental health to provide cutting-edge, evidence-based training for practitioners. You can learn firsthand from experts like Stephen C. Hayes, Kelly Wilson, Robin Walzer, Kirk Strausel, and many others. Find your next training at PraxisCET.com. That's PraxisCET.com. I want to ask a little bit about stories. What are some of the stories that we might tell ourselves in relationships? Well, <laughs> there may be positive stories like this <laughs> person's wonderful and I found my one true love. But more commonly, uh, at least in clinical practice, we encounter some pretty negative stories. And so they may be self stories, you know, I'm not good enough, I don't matter, you know, I'm letting my partner down and so forth. Or they may be stories about the other, you know, they're not good enough, they don't care, they're selfish, they're lazy. Either way, those kind of stories, if you get hooked by them, uh, are going to uh, pull you into problematic or self-defeating patterns of behavior. And yeah, I mean, there's so many different types of story, um, but they're, they're all basically some version of the not good enough story. You know, I'm not good enough, or you're not good enough, or our relationship's not good enough, or this, that, the other's not good enough. And um, uh, we can't stop these stories showing up, but we can learn to notice them and name them and recognize them. Oh, there it is again. There's the you know, the X, Y, Z story, I know this one, just kind of stopping to notice and name it will often take some of its impact away. So it kind of frees us up to make some different choices. Instead of letting the story dictate what we do, we can come back to our values and use those as a guide. Absolutely. And what role does self-kindness and self-compassion play in doing this work? Oh, a massive role. I mean, you know, self-compassion is is such a central element of the ACT model. And sometimes people don't seem to get this because it doesn't appear on the ACT hexaflex. They're like, oh, where does the self-compassion come in? But self-compassion is is constructed from the six core elements of the hexaflex. You know, it's kind of at the core of self-compassion is values, values of kindness and caring, which we translate into committed action. What are kind things I can do for myself? What are kind words I can say to myself? This is self-compassion I'm talking about here. Um, you know, diffusion from harsh self-judgment, acceptance of difficult feelings, uh, contacting the present moment, noticing it, acknowledging what's painful, 
stressful and difficult in my life right now uh, and self as context in the sense of flexible perspective taking seeing that you know my pain and my suffering is something that I have in common with other human beings and so whether it's compassion for others or self-compassion uh, it's fundamentally important in act and very very important in relationships because of course we're going to get hurt um, and so, you know, uh, there's this cruel paradox is that, you know, there's an old, old English song from the 1930s, you always hurt the one you love, even in the best relationships, at times we will get hurt. So uh, can we be compassionate to ourselves? Can we acknowledge how painful this is? You know, that hurt doesn't necessarily mean that our partner's uh, done something wrong either. It, it might, might be we just hurt. We're, we're hurting, I should say, you know, or, or in pain because maybe your partner's in the armed forces and they're in danger, or maybe your partner's sick or ill and uh, and they're suffering. And of course, that brings up a lot of pain for you. Um, so, uh, but of course, we can also get hurt in the sense of conflict and argument and so forth. So, being kind and caring and loving to ourselves and just acknowledging how difficult it is. You know, it, it's, it's, there's a lot of pain that comes with, with loving and caring for another human being, unfortunately. Some cosmic joke has been played on us up there. It sucks. <laughs> You know, some clients resist self-compassion. They, you know, they think it's the same as self-pity. And, and so but it's not self-pity. Self-pity is like, oh, poor me. How terrible it is that, you know, uh, that these things happened. Why me? It's not fair. And that kind of pushes people away. People don't like self-pity. Uh, self-compassion is really just acknowledging your pain and being there with genuine kindness for yourself. And compassion for your partner too. It's it's difficult for them, just as it's difficult for us. It's difficult for our partners, and uh, and they will screw up, and they will hurt, and they will make mistakes, and we will do things and say things that inevitably hurt them at times. So, can we extend that compassion to our partner? Um, and you know, uh, I recommend that when couples are fighting or having an argument, things are getting heated, that they take a break. But when you take a break, don't go off and ruminate about all the bad things your partner says and does. That's not going to help. Then you're just going to come back, you know, <laughs> primed for more conflict. Take a break. First of all, practice some self-compassion, acknowledge how you're hurting. And then uh, this is not always possible, but if possible, see if you can also tap into a bit of compassion for your partner. You know, the argument you just had is bringing up painful feelings for them too, and they're hurting too. And you didn't, neither of you came into this relationship because you wanted to fight and argue. You know, you're both hurting. You're both suffering. Man, being a person is hard. <laughs> <laughs> it really is you know i can understand why some people go off and live in caves for years you know it's kind of... <laughs> <laughs> me too as we start to wrap up and you know we've practiced the self-compassion toward ourselves and our partners we've unhooked from those negative feelings what are some ways that couples can begin to create rituals of connection yeah that's a, a great question to uh you know, really explore with couples um, because so often what happens is over time, people uh, just do lose connection with each other, even if there's no major problems. They're just, you know, get into their ruts and their routines. So, you know, um, it's important to make times where you do things that really enable you to tap into love and playfulness and having fun or something meaningful, something connecting, you know, not just zoning out in front of the television. Um, you know, for example, it's a very different experience going out to the movies than just scrolling through Netflix. Um, uh, so you can explore what did you used to do in the past um, on a regular basis to tap into love and connection. You know, and, and some people, uh, you know, are very good at this you know they, they keep it going they've got their regular things that they do they go mountain climbing or they play tennis or they you know have a family dinner on a regular basis but many people uh they just kind of let this slide so it can be something like a regular date night it can be a course that you do together it can be 
something as simple as just uh, agreeing once a week we'll go for a, a walk in, in nature or we'll play cards together i mean you know it, you you want couples to kind of find things that that work for them uh, do a bit of a brainstorm they can look back on what they used to do in the past they can consider what they might like to do uh, that they've you know often oh wouldn't it be nice if we did that or the other but they never actually get around to doing it and, and it can just be really simple it can just be going for a, a, a walk in nature or you know uh, having a, a, a candlelit dinner or making love gosh you know i mean <laughs> there's there's so many uh, jokes out there about lack of sex in relationships because you know, when you are with someone for a long period of time, inevitably, uh, you know, for almost everyone, sexual desire does reduce. And uh, so it can be, well, instead of waiting until the mood grabs me, maybe making time to uh, have some uh, physical intimacy, sexual intimacy, um, but actually planning it. Don't wait for spontaneity. Let's say, you know, on Saturday afternoon, let's go to bed for an hour, see what happens. Don't necessarily have to have sex. We may just cuddle and kiss or whatever, or we may do, let's put on some music. Let's make, you know, uh, let's make it uh, about connection and engaging and not about, uh, you know, in the book, one of the topics I, I cover is goal-focused sex, which is all about the performance and I have to get the orgasm and, you know, I have to get the direction and it has to be uh you know amazing and if you kind of put that sort of performance pressure on yourself or your partner it'll actually uh, make sex a, a, an anxiety provoking experience so um make it more about values focused uh kind of physical connection you know about just being present and connecting and tuning into each other's bodies and experiences but of course you know you have to have a, a good relationship first uh I, you know sometimes I get couples who, who their relationship outside the bedroom is just terrible. And then they're surprised to find that their sex life is bad too. And it's like, well, all right, first let's, let's fix up things outside the bedroom before you start trying to have a good time in the bedroom. Absolutely. That makes sense. And I appreciate that all of the activities listed require you to, to put in the effort, to plan that, to think about that, to talk about it with your partner and to really, even there's a connection over creating those rituals. So I, I like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do you have any final thoughts for our listeners? <laughs> I'm getting there. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess we've kind of focused in this uh, interview mostly on the kind of difficulties in relationships. And we've talked a lot about hard work, but of course, you know, there's also times where it's not hard work and, you know, it's fun and playful and, and so it's really important to enjoy those. Don't take them for granted, actually, you know, kind of savor all those little moments where things are going well or things are peaceful or you're having fun. You know, that kind of savoring aspect of mindfulness and appreciating is so important. Well, thank you so much for us for your time. This has been such a great conversation. Oh, well, thanks, Cassie. Thanks for inviting me. This fully revised edition of Act With Love, therapist and world-renowned ACT expert Russ Harris shows us how developing psychological flexibility, the ability to be in the present moment with openness, awareness, and focus, and to take effective action in line with one's values can help you and your partner strengthen your relationship. Also included is new information on attachment theory, mindfulness, and self-compassion techniques, and assertiveness and boundary setting skills. You'll learn how to let go of conflict, open up, and live fully in the present. Use mindfulness to increase intimacy, connection, and understanding, resolve painful conflicts, and reconcile long-standing differences, and act on your values to build a meaningful relationship. If you're looking to increase feelings of intimacy, love, and connection with your partner, this book has everything you need to get started together. Visit our website at www.newharbinger.com and use coupon code PODCAST25 to receive 25% off your entire order. New Harbinger Publications is an independent, employee-owned publisher of books on psychology, health, spirituality, and personal growth. For 50 years, our evidence-based self-help books and pioneering workbooks have helped readers make positive changes to improve mental health and well-being. Founded by psychologists Matthew McKay and Patrick Fanning, New Harbinger is proud to be an employee-owned company. Our books reflect our core values of integrity, sustainability, compassion, and trust. 
Written by leaders in the field and recommended by therapists worldwide, New Harbinger books are practical, accessible, and provide real tools for real change. Join the New Harbinger Clinicians Club, a free membership club exclusively for mental health professionals. Sign up today and you'll receive a special welcome gift, 35% off all professional books, free client resources, free eBooks throughout the year, access to private sales, a subscription to our quick tips for therapists email program, and more. Visit newharbinger.com slash clinicians dash club for more information. If you enjoyed today's episode, we'd love if you rated, reviewed, and subscribed to the show, and we hope you might share it with anyone who might benefit from the content. This podcast is not a substitute for counseling with a licensed provider. Thank you.